I'm Luke Kennedy with the McCain Institute, and you're in the arena with leaders and citizens who are taking character-based action. I'm thrilled to be in the arena with Jane Mossbacher Morris. She's the founder and CEO, I believe I have that right, of To The Market, which is all about connecting ethically made products to businesses and people, to uh, consumers. So mm -hmm. really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank uh, you. A lot of ground we could cover. I just read your book, which covers a lot of ground, and I encourage folks to read it, By the Change You Want to See. You hear an awful lot about Be the Change. I love this concept of Buy the Change You Want to See and how your purchasing power can help you uh, do that. And we're certainly going to get into that. But you, you worked at the State Department taking on counterterrorism, uh, women's issues, and then decided to take a bit of a turn and uh, get into business, essentially, but kind of putting all these things uh, together. And a little bit of a build up here, but um, human trafficking has been in the news a lot lately and has been in the news more and more, which mm -hmm. ultimately is a good thing for, for awareness. But if I'm not uh, mistaken, it played a big role in, in, in you taking charting the path that you've charted. It did, and after um, after my time at the State Department, I came and joined the, the McCain Institute as the first director of humanitarian action, and um, Mrs. Cindy McCain, who's very passionate about fighting human trafficking, um, really gave me the mandate of thinking about how could the Institute, which was very new when I joined, so this was 2012, how could the Institute really make sure it was adding value to all of the existing incredible work that's doing, that's being done around the world to fight trafficking? And that meant, in my case, doing a lot of research and sort of fact-finding to understand where could the Institute add most value, who was doing what, what was working well that was worthy of building on, and then where were there dearths in what was being done, and where could the Institute potentially fill in there? Right. And uh, I had the opportunity to travel abroad, which I'd done many times in the State Department, of course, for, for counterterrorism work and then for global women's issues work. Um, but this was specifically around human trafficking and labor exploitation. And um, I, I remember very clearly one of the trips that I took was with Mrs. Cindy McCain, and we talk about this in the book, By the Change. Um, we went to India, and we went to both uh, New Delhi and to Calcutta with a wonderful anti-human trafficking organization called International Justice Mission. And IJM was hosting the McCain Institute, so Mrs. McCain and I, uh, on this fact-finding trip. And we had an opportunity to walk red light districts to understand what does that dynamic even look like in real life. Um, we had the opportunity to visit some of IJM's work, um, including aftercare facilities, which of course is where survivors of trafficking and other forms of abuse are able to heal uh, both physically and uh, psychologically. Right. And then ultimately, uh, we had an opportunity to visit two social enterprises that were set up in uh, very near Calcutta's red light districts that were actually employing human trafficking survivors to produce products. And one of them, called Freeset, was making logoed hemp bags um, that literally were being sold, I think, at that point in Whole Foods. And another, Sari Bari, was employing human trafficking survivors to make really beautiful blankets and purses out of sort of upcycled Sari fabric, which is a traditional fabric from South Asia. Right. And I remember being so impressed by two things. One, the quality of the product. So the fact that I was looking at products that I would want to buy, that I know I felt comfortable gifting um, to other people, and that it was uh, not only a gift that they would appreciate because of the story, but because of the quality of the product. But secondly, I was so moved by the dignity of work that I witnessed. And the dignity of work is a huge sort of part of my own personal narrative and um, what I believe is a huge part of why we exist on this planet. Um, when people, whether it's women or men, but particularly those that are post-trauma, have an opportunity to work and to feel like their work is uh, done in a dignified way and is contributing financially to their family, to their communities, to their country, the shift that they feel internally, the transformation that they experience internally is so unique 
And um, it's such a self-esteem builder because they realize that they are capable of contributing right. um, and being ultimately in control of their own destiny because they have the ability to earn an income and then make choices about their life. So that experience um, visiting those two social enterprises really put me on this path of saying, how do I connect ethical suppliers like these two to brands, retailers, and corporations here in the United States that have much more purchasing power than I do? And you've you've done it, and you're going out and doing it. And that epiphany, you connected to, hey, we need to do this from a market and from a business-driven mm -hmm. perspective. So. Um, you've talked a little bit about the kind of maker side of the equation. Talk a little bit about the, the, the consumer uh, side of it. I feel really strongly about leveraging the market to make change on all sorts of social justice related issues that could be around um, people, that can be around the planet. When the market is involved, um, the forces that you can bring to bear are often much more significant than even the capital that the not-for-profit world or the government is capable of bringing. So when you look at retail, for example, the, the U.S. retail market is a $2.5 trillion market. We don't spend $2.5 trillion in, in our, you know, our U.S. aid um, in the not-for-profit space. Even looking at the products that bear the name of our companies or our nonprofits, that industry in the U.S. alone is a $21 billion industry. Yeah. So this is big money. Yeah. So you begin to think about how do we harness the purchasing power of companies, big and small, everything from solopreneurs up to Fortune 50 companies, how do we begin to harness their purchasing power so they are sourcing products from companies that are having a positive impact on the planet or on other people? And, you know, I I'll, I'll take a little bit of a different angle here, I suppose. And it's the whole thing is it's it's products that people are going to like and do. This isn't charity. This is That's business right. at the end of the day. And it's connecting people up to things that they want. Uh, I get it's a podcast. So I'm probably going to ask you to describe this better than I can. I'll call it a, a napkin ring that, you know, almost looks like it could be from Africa and is really uh, elegant. You describe things way better than I. And we, we do have a, a, a YouTube version filming where some people can see this. But you know, this I, I bought this from you. We had barely met. We have our, our annual Sedona forum and you had a small market set up there. And, you know, I was in consumer mode. This looks kind of neat. My my family isn't able to join me at this neat conference. I ought to bring something back kind of as a gift to, mm -hmm. you know, be able to connect with them and, 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 and give them something and say I had a, you know, an engaged few days at this conference. And this caught my eye to be quite honest and I don't remember much more it just looked good mm -hmm. and neat and the sort of thing that I could see on my table now can you fill in kind of the fill in the blanks and the rest of the story on that mm -hmm. absolutely so you're right it's from Africa <laughs> um, these are from Kenya and um, these are actually upcycled cow bone I believe um, that have been painted or dyed to um, create really beautiful napkin rings um, so they're sort of like a batik for folks who are just listening, they're a bit of a batik, sort of hand-carved um, set of napkin rings that are black and white that are from Kenya. And um, aesthetically, I think they're very beautiful. I, I could just as easily see them sitting in something like a Saks Fifth Avenue or a Neiman Marcus. I, I agree with you. Yeah, um, yeah really. I felt unique. like I was getting a deal, quite honestly. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a deal, a deal. I'm kind of a deal-oriented person. A deal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you, the point that you made um, – just earlier about th these are not pity purchases and and they are never intended to be and that doesn't extend the intent of employment which is the dignity of work is not charity right mm -hmm. these are these are capable women they're not children and they're talented makers um, they're not people that we should pity and they don't right. want to be pitied um, so the product that they're making and that we're buying, we're buying it because we think it can sell and we think we can make money off of it. Right. And I think that's where you see the power of the market coming into play. So you know, are there big factors out there online? And you have an online part of your business. But then I think this for me, part was like being able to touch it and feel it. So how do you think about that when you go and bring things to scale? And then I'm sure you get asked, uh, I don't know if it was addressed in the book, it probably was, but China is such a huge market and player. So those two kind of things, how do you, how do you wrestle with that? Yeah. Um, so sort of working backwards, um, we don't have any suppliers in China right now. 
Um, so much of what to the market offers uh, when we work with other brands, retailers, and corporations. So we do custom sourcing and custom manufacturing of apparel, accessories, and home goods. What we're bringing to the table is these non-traditional suppliers. So that could be artisanal makers who are potentially in a part of the world that a big box retailer would n never you know, have the opportunity to potentially engage and source from without somebody like it to the market being involved. Right. Um, that could they be- They just don't know how to connect that, yeah. It could be a function of discoverability, so not being able to find them, but even if they can find them, each supplier that a retailer or brand or corporation works with, there is risk associated with them. There's an onboarding process. Um, there are payment terms, oftentimes that just don't work for some of these non-traditional suppliers. Right. And so having somebody like a to-the-market be a part of that process is a really critical Because you're connecting way. a number of cooperatives and entities in a way that allows it, allows it exactly. to work. Exactly. So we are helping to democratize um, the accessibility of these suppliers being able to be a part of the supply chain of big businesses. So you, the podcast is called In the Arena, and it's taking on uh, a big, uh, big challenges. And you're doing that. I would, you know, hopefully, anybody could recognize that with your business. But let's look at it from an individual perspective. I'll just talk about myself. You know, I've read your book, and I thought, well, you know, I use these Keurig uh, pods, and I'm like, well, I'm not really committed now to each time filling an individual pod, but I think I could buy the biodegradable pod. That's kind yeah. of where I'm at. And I'm struck behind your book. You, I think, meet people where they are at or encourage them to think about, you know, coming at it from where they're at and what the next step is. Yeah. I mean, so the book by the change is really all about how both businesses and consumers can align their purchasing decisions with their values. And, um, you know, there's a role for everybody in making change, but I am not an activist. Um, and um, this book is is written in a way very purposely so that it's about making micro changes. And what I recommend is that consumers pick a single category to start that you care about. And that could be literally the gifts that you give. That could be the coffee that you drink in the morning. Um, that could be the, uh, the clothing that you choose to buy for yourself. And pick that category and then research that industry. So in my case, um, I care about uh, you know two things in particular in the book. Um, one is coffee. Yep. I'm an avid coffee drinker. And chocolate's another one in there, uh, well, right? I, I adore <laughs> chocolate, but I, yeah. coffee is, I mean, if I if I ate as much chocolate as I drank coffee, I would be hugely fat. But um, I do love chocolate and eat it all the time, as I talk about in the book. Um, but, you know, chocolate, uh, coffee rather, and then clothes are two things right. that I, of course, engage in every day. I work in the retail industry, so, of course, um, I'm engaging in clothes. And then um, I drink coffee constantly. I exist on coffee. And so I, I researched both of those categories, um, decided things that I cared about. So in the coffee industry, for example, um, coffee is one of the most transparent supply chains in the entire world. Right. And it actually has the opportunity to be the first sustainable commodity in the world, which is really fascinating. And what's cool is that because it's so transparent, there are more ways than ever to understand who, grow, who grew the coffee beans um, and how are they grown. Meaning if I'm someone who's super engaged around the environment, I can choose coffee blends that are Rainforest Alliance certified. They're shade grown. They're USD or USDA organic. All of these certifications are becoming more and more clearly sort of promoted on the bag so you can identify what you care about and then and decide to support those coffee you know that specific coffee brand similarly i could care about the labor potentially and i would want to go towards maybe fair trade certified um, right. bags of coffee and then you as an individual deciding that you are going to use your conscious consumer as a muscle just in the coffee industry I've been on the ground um, and seen the difference that it makes when a handful of individuals decide to support a company. I mean, I literally have seen, there's a blend I talk about in the book that's called Quiche Coffee. It's a women-grown blend in Guatemala. And that's very unusual that you would have a blend or uh, coffee beans that would be harvested primarily by women. It's usually something that more men are engaged in. And and we have shown how 
um, when these women uh, farmers are supported that they have better educational and nutritional outcomes for their families. Um, this specific blend is in Guatemala. But I've seen so many times how inconsequential decisions for us, you deciding to you know, buy this blend versus that blend, has a massive quality of life impact on the life of somebody else. Well, you've opened my eyes to that. I think you're opening a lot of people's eyes to that. And it's, I think, you know, at times you can feel like, oh my gosh, I know I should be doing this and almost, you know, be thinking about it almost from a guilt perspective. Mm. You can make it fun. And, 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 I, and I'll tell you what made it fun for me and it probably makes it fun for a lot of folks is, you know, I feel like I'm just promoting your book here and that's not really what, what, what I'm doing. It's, you've gone to Guatemala, you've gone to the Dominican Republic, you've gone to Haiti, and it just, it's the meaning that when you understand how these things connect and who's on the other side of it and sure how it's helping them build their communities, but just kind of getting a, a, a look at the lay of the land and what they're, what they're doing and what, how it, how it connects. I think for too many of us, you know, a place like Haiti, for example, you think and you talk about the devastation and, and the really bad things that happen. You don't think enough about the people and, and, and Guatemala. I really, um, I thought I knew a little bit about Guatemala. A lot going on in places like Guatemala that I think we don't know about and that we are connected to even if we don't realize it. Definitely. I mean, and I think when we, when we sort of talk about the idea of aligning purchasing decisions and your values, um, I obviously care deeply about things like women's economic empowerment, and because I source and work around the world, I have my fingers in a lot of these developing communities. But my husband, you know, he's from Kentucky. He feels really strongly about U.S. jobs. So for him, him aligning his purchasing decisions with his values is deciding he's going to support, you know, that uh, mom and pop grocery store right. on the corner in Kentucky, or he wants to make sure that we're buying as many clothes as we can that are made in the USA. He's able to talk trash. You can talk trash a little bit too. I'm sorry yes. to jump in there, right? Yes, but- <laughs> that's right. Literally the waste, waste and recycling industry, yeah. which he's in. But meaning, pur- you're aligning your purchasing decisions and your values doesn't necessarily mean just supporting people in a different part of the world. Right. It also can just mean I want to support you know firefighters and so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna buy fire department coffee which is founded and run by um, you know former firefighters and they donate proceeds back to US based firefighters so it's it's so based on what's important to you so it's adding meaning and consciousness to uh, your purchasing power and what you're buying talk about the ethical part of it and and labor conditions and and you know it's a big big piece of it right and kind of the state of play that's a big way to put it i suppose but that's a big part of this as well yeah i mean so for the fashion industry in particular um it has been plagued by um both environmental and labor um, challenges and i think that's largely a function of the fact that when um when production moved overseas it became very hard for us as as Americans to track uh, how our products were being made and who were making them. And we also became very um, sort of price focused, which continued to drive down the price um, that uh, we asked factories pr- to produce units around. And because of that, um, garment workers um, tend to be compensated um, in a way that is is pretty shockingly low. And so that's something that uh, to the market and the number of companies that we talk about in the book are really trying to address is how do we improve the labor conditions of the people that are making the products that you and I enjoy every day? Um, Certainly we talk about the Rana Plaza disaster, which was this very um, tragic event where a building that was producing products for a number of major brands collapsed in Bangladesh and it killed a thousand people. And the sort of, um, it's, it's a little bit um, harsh to say, but so, sort of the, the phrase that came out of that was, nobody should have to die for fashion. Mm. And it's, it's, it's true. Why would someone need to suffer so I feel like I can look pretty? Which doesn't mean um, that, that efficiencies and, and, and factories uh, can't produce something at a low price, right? Of course. But, and we talk about that. Not all factories are evil and not all small manufacturers or small businesses are, are operating in an ethical way. You can absolutely produce in mass with operational efficiencies at price accessible um, points and be profitable, um, but do so in a way that is ultimately respecting your workers and having a better impact on the environment. So uh, 
kind of a variant of our final question, which is advice for people that would like to follow in your footsteps and, 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 and otherwise uh, step into the arena. But I looked it up. I, I hope I'm right. 36% of Americans have a, a passport. And it, that strikes me as low, and I think it's low compared to other countries, probably a lot of factors uh, uh, in, in, in that. So I think I'd like you to kind of, you know, you've traveled the world, and that's made such a big difference. You can, I guess, connect to other parts in the world and not travel, so maybe I'm a little short-sighted and thinking more folks should have a passport. So maybe comment on how that's uh, informed and, 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 and from an advice perspective. And then maybe I'm trying to do a little uh, too much with this question, but um, that business degree, you went from government to business and you went and got an MBA. Um, is that part of your advice as well? Pick yeah. up any, any parts of that you want to pick up. Yeah. I mean, so on the passport thing, um, it, it does seem low, but it also doesn't shock me because the U.S. is so big and we have so many different types of topographies and different cultures. I mean, I'm from the South. I've lived in the North. Um, I feel like, you know, when I'm in California, I'm like, I totally adore it, but it's like a different planet. Right. Um, so it doesn't totally shock me that don't, more Americans don't have passports because we as a country have so much to offer. That said, I can personally share that travel abroad has been hugely impactful um, for me. And I think um, in a couple of ways, one is that um, it reminds you how sort of small and insignificant you are. And I think that's important that we are a part of sort of a, a greater community and that oftentimes our world can seem really small and our problems can seem really big. Right. And when we get outside of ourselves, um, we very quickly realize, first of all, there are people right now on this planet that are living vastly different lives than we. I mean, their experience on this planet is so very different every day from us and that's super important to keep in mind um, that not everybody is exactly like us but similarly it also has shown me because of many of the countries I've gotten to, to visit how incredibly fortunate we are I mean and just I mean I don't want to say spoiled but um, we are so fortunate to be, of course, I'm American, um, to be in a country that has basic infrastructure, right. that I was able to um, achieve my dreams, that I was able to go to business school. I've been to so many places where women struggle to even you know, continue into their high school years. And for me, how fortunate I am that I have even that choice that I get to go to business school. Um, so I think it's a very grounding experience to spend time in other cultures. And we're reminded just how fortunate we are as Americans. So circling back, what, uh, um, any kind of that is advice, really, but any additional advice you'd like to offer to folks that are pondering their career decisions or paths or right now? Yeah, I would say um, be open to where you feel like you can serve. And what I mean by that is um, I never in a million years would have envisioned that I would be uh, – starting and running a retail related business. I mean, I was like 100% positive I would work in national security when I got out of college my entire life. And when um, challenges and opportunities presented themselves to me about how I could make a difference, how my unique skill set could potentially add value to the lives of other people, it gave me an opportunity to do something that I never would have env originally envisioned. And so um, to make that into advice, I would say, you know, keep your, your eyes and also your heart open to what are things that are pulling on your heartstrings. Everybody has different passions, and that's a good thing. You know, it, we don't want to all be passionate about the same issue. Um, right. Then we would all be, you know, wanting to volunteer or be a part of uh, helping that one issue. It's good that people have different passions. So listen to what uh, pulls on your heartstrings and then think about what are your unique skill sets that can add unique value. Because just deciding you want to get behind something is one thing, but thinking about how can you and your specific skill set add the most value to an issue, that's where I think you really see um, you know, a really positive impact coming out of your engagement. All right. With that, we're going to thank you very much. We're going to be keeping an eye on uh, to the market, and we hope you'll come back and spend some more time with us down the line. Thank you for having me. This podcast is produced by Patrick McCann and Justin Kessler. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, tell your friends, or leave a review.